So there's a moment that kind of changes our life plans. I think a lot of you can relate to this. You might be browsing in a store when you see the one. And even though you're told not to judge a book by its cover, you can't help yourself. You want, you need to find their story. And that's when the adventure begins. But am I talking about buying books or finding love? Well, chances are both because I believe that great relationships have a lot to do with great books. They challenge us to become a better version of ourselves. We like the way they smell. We wanna, we wanna take them with us everywhere we go when we travel, and there's nothing better than curling up with them at night, especially on those cold and rainy days. But the very best books, like the best people, help us discover who we really are. Now, I once had a relationship that began like it was something from a storybook, the details of which could have easily been made into a Hollywood movie. But after a number of years, that eventually changed into a long distance friendship. And that eventually sent me into the dark world of online dating. <laughs> now, having been out of a relationship, or being in a relationship for some time, had me a little bit out of practice. And I like the idea of using the internet, though, because I like data, I like metrics. I mean, as a marketing guy, I thought I could hack the system and use everything I learned about search engine optimization, Boolean search filters, and how people think to optimize my profile. It's like having a great book title. I thought it was pretty clever. My friends told me that it was really weird. So they started giving me all kinds of advice, like the stuff you would hear in a typical rom -com. Things like, you know, you should really try and get a date within three message exchanges so you'll still have something to talk about in person. And that you should never respond to a message in less than 72 hours, otherwise you'll appear really desperate. And of course, they told me to drop my chart. You see, I developed a self-compatibility chart for some I created a list of 20 attributes that I wanted in a partner, each one with their own weighted values. This fed into a decision-making metric that allowed me to rank people by fit. I thought this was pretty cool. My friends told me it was really creepy. <laughs> but I was like, you know what, the site does that for you anyway. It'll say you're an 87% match with so-and-so. And I'm like, by whose formula? Theirs. Not mine. I mean, do you watch every single movie that Netflix recommends to you? Do you buy every product on the Amazon homepage? Of course not. Because at some point, you have to make your own decisions. You have to have your own process. This is both an art and a science. Well, these same friends were relentless, and they kept on throwing their advice down, telling me, you know, you just gotta get out there. You gotta meet as many people as possible. So finally, I listened. And they also told me, like, okay, when you go on the date, make sure you don't do a couple things. Number one, you never talk about your other dates or bad relationships or anything like that, especially on the first date. Number two, you should hide the fact that you don't wanna have kids. So I said, all right, all right, I'll just go out there. And so I went on dates, like a lot of them, like several dozen per week. In fact, sometimes three or four per night. <laughs> what I would do is book out a restaurant, show up, and schedule the dates every few hours. So when one ended, I could walk out, come right back in like I just got there, and be ready. Now, this confused a lot of restaurants and a lot of waiters, but this was about efficiency, about trying to find somebody. And to help me keep track of everybody, I created this Google spreadsheet. They had their names, sibling count, important information like things we talked about in case there'd be like a pop quiz in a future date. You know, I wanted to be ready for that second and third date. The problem was that most of the time there was some kind of deal breaker in the process and there wasn't that second or third date. Like just something would happen that made me not want to come back ever again. For example, there was, um, we'll call them four beers. This is a person who drank four beers over the course of dinner and then wanted to race me on their bike while I drove to a bar so they could get more drinks. <laughs> I only had hot tea that night. Then there was the person who sent me photos of themselves 
dressed like a geisha, complete with eyes taped back. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was a, someone that I thought had a potential fit, but quickly deflated my interest. You see, there was a new dinosaur exhibit that came to our science museum in town, ones where they showed feathers on them instead of just scales, and I thought this was really cool. When I asked how they felt about it, they told me they were dino-neutral. And I was like, dino-neutral? Like, how could you feel neutral about the most amazing creatures of Earth of all time? <laughs> I guess you could say I felt a little bit neutral about them after that exchange. <laughs> I was about to give up when I finally decided to try one last time. There was someone else interested in, but I thought, I'm gonna do it by my own rules, instead of what my friends have been telling me, instead of what the internet's been telling me. And so we started trading these really long and deep emails where we talked about our favorite books, and we traded life stories. And after several weeks of this, we finally met up in person for dinner. Now, when I first saw her smile, that, that was it. I just kept on breaking rules. <laughs> When she went to the bathroom, I texted one of my friends, like, I think I found the one. <laughs> I got really excited. And then after dinner, we went on this really long walk where I talked about all these really horrible dating experiences. And I was like, yeah, I definitely don't want to have kids no matter what, the smell, <laughs> things like this. And we ended up at a show where my friends were performing, including the one that I texted. I thought all this was going really great when after being up there for a few minutes, she told me that she wasn't feeling well and she needed to go home right away. I thought, that's it. Like, I messed up. I felt dejected. And as I started walking back towards my car, I noticed I had a message. She told me she had a great time. So I immediately asked for a date that following Saturday. But on Thursday, I learned about the Walking with Dinosaurs exhibit, the live show, coming to our local <laughs> arena. So I decided to ask for a third date before we even had our second. Curious, she agreed. And this time, I definitely wasn't afraid to let my geek flag fly. I bought front row center tickets like a baller to that. <laughs> and we went. And as some kids were getting kind of loud behind us, I was like, hey, maybe if your parents loved you more, they'd buy you some better seats. <laughs> or at least that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Instead, I did the proper adult thing by passively, aggressively sitting up taller whenever they made noise, <laughs> easing up a bit when they uh, quieted down. And somehow she was amused by all of this, including not thinking it was too weird that I was seriously considering this hat that I was trying on in the shape of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. You know, that's when I realized that books like love aren't special because of how, how they start, because they're on some kind of list or they're recommended by a friend. You know, the best relationships, just like the best books, are when we can truly learn who we are and inhibit and encounter them alone. Life's lessons don't come in this one-size-fits-all package. Like, what, what's, what works for one person might not work for yourself. And in the same way that sometimes we become more obsessed with the idea of reading to a point where we forget to actually sit down and read, sometimes we're so infatuated with the idea of romance and finding someone to love us that we lose ourselves in the process. Well, those few dates turned into quite a few more. And on October of 2016, I flew her to Shanghai, China, where I proposed in a real-life fairy tale castle, just like one in the storybooks. And that following spring, we got married in the beautiful Lansu Chinese Gardens in Portland, Oregon. While well, I was wearing my lucky dinosaur socks, of course. While it seems more romantic and spontaneous to begin a story in an independent bookstore than browsing online, how you find love and how you begin a journey isn't important as actually stepping forward to take that journey at all. So I believe that there actually is hope out there. And it doesn't matter if you need to use an app, a Google spreadsheet, or applying everything you've ever learned from education to help make it happen. That doesn't make it any less special. 
to stay true to yourself, to your own rules. Avoid racist cosplay photos and focus less on the lure of how a story begins and focus more on finding someone who can help you write that story together. Thank you.